Welcome back to the Sean Trey Show. Uh, today, uh, tonight, I have with me uh, Parker Schmidt. Now, welcome to the podcast, man, or to the video cast, whatever you want to call this. Um, would you like to tell the guest who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm Parker. Um, I am a film and director and photographer. Um, I'm currently in Lisbon, Portugal right now. Uh, I come from the action sports scene. I used to be a professional downhill skateboarder for about seven years. Um, and then had in the past probably, let's say, two, three years, taken more of a focus on doing um, film production and photography. And um, I have my own studio now and um, work with a great group out in Los Angeles, um, House of Spoils, that um, hosts just uh, a couple of my photographs as well and get to run around with a lot of really cool people and um my main focus is in like the uh, outdoor and active and sports scene and so my studio called bonus run um that's kind of where our emphasis lies and we work with clients such as like porsche and mercedes and most recently having done a surf film for a corona beer um and yeah it's been pretty fun i uh that's awesome as a, like i've been basically homeless for the past year and a half having just jumped from one project to the next and so it's been um really fun just keeping the the candle burning in that way of just always having to think about the next thing coming up and while i'm young i can, can have the excuse for that so yeah yeah when you get my age and you got a kid it, it changes <laughs> yeah. it's nice yeah for me, yeah man. i'm sure i'm sure but the thing is is i i i, I so you get to see there's these really cool different niche markets in the film industry. You know, you have a lot of people think when they get into film, like everything's Hollywood, but you know, you, mm -hmm. you have tons of different, you know, different areas that people get into. And, and now it's expanding even more. Like last night I had my friend Andrew on and Andrew is a DOP and we would work together on some big, you know, cinematic films. And he's just a cool guy. And we were talking about how, one of the areas that we were geeking out on was the FPV stuff, man. Like, you know, it's just so cool, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and we're not talking like the basic drone stuff, but like, you know, the guy that I'm, I absolutely would love to meet someday. And I, I love his work is Johnny FPV, mm -hmm. you know, it's like insane stuff, you know, just like, it, it's crazy. And the cool part is, is we're entering into this new, this new time where we've got a bunch of creative tools that people can kind of harness, you know, GoPro kind of revolutionized the action, the action sports scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, n now people are, you know, the, even some of the nicer cameras are getting, you know, smaller form. Like last night, Andrew was saying like he was, he uses the red Komodo for a lot of the action shots now because it's just, it is so damn small. You know, it, what do you think about all that? Like, what, what do you feel about you know, the, uh, the fun stuff that you're doing, man. I mean, you have to mention the cinematic mode on the new iPhone as well. Uh, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, a, a, like a lot of that stuff, like it becomes a, a blurred mix of, um, like the difference between being a content creator and a filmmaker. And that yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mixed up in that, in that crowd as well, as far as the people I work with who a lot of them have come from doing more content creation where, um, it's a bit more of like turn and burn production and, yeah. um, then like full on filmmaking where if you have somebody who came from content creation going in, it's like filmmaking and had to be like a one man band, like independent filmmaker, like, like not even maybe touching narrative stuff, but, what I'm familiar with just a lot of outdoor people like having to, to do their own thing and having to have really high demanding clients when what they're having to deliver. And then they go into doing yeah. either more narrative stuff or commercial pieces where it's like just 60 seconds. You have to worry about like just a two minute, like short doc. Um, it, it, it's something that I think they have a pretty, um, great upper hand with when they, are able to to go from having such a small camera to then going to like a larger like set or production where they then can like focus on exactly what they're wanting to do. I yeah. I think when the more people you get involved, the more fun it gets because people are really mm -hmm. fun, and you get then <laughs> right? so many people that are so much better at what you do when you're having to be a one man yeah. band. Because I, I kind of started from that too. I, I really quickly yeah. got into, into the team playing like group, which I was lucky for. That's awesome. Um, having I like, come from skateboarding and where there's like no teams or anything, like I was pretty against like having to do like school sports or anything like that because I didn't like 
having to rely on others. But when you have uh, a whole bunch of people that are like, in their own lane, but providing something to a bigger cause, it's so, so incredible. And like how that can all come together. And so, I mean, I think I, I didn't have like a particular answer about the gear and that stuff as well. Cause I'm not necessarily a gearhead. I love the cameras that I get to work with and stuff and love the results yeah. of them. But, um, I've been stuck shooting analog for the past year and a half too, since that's all I've, really? I've, all I've had hands on. Yeah. I have, um, this is the main camera I've been working on. It's a Leica oh. R3. Um, nice. and I have a medium format as well, but I just haven't had the chance to shoot digital as much. And then when I do, it's because of, of a production and then I'm yeah. like either having to do another job or something else, but having to shoot analog, it's pretty fun to just not have then 2000 pictures at the end of the day, but having like yes. three rolls. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I'm, I'm the, my, my, my main camera is up over here. I, I, I shoot on uh, um, Canon EOS one N. Yeah, which is the old yeah old film camera for yeah for, yeah for Canon EOS line and I, I love it man I, I love yeah. absolutely love it and I'm a huge film fan and I've got like four others up there too that are you know I have uh what I have a little Olympus OM2 and mm-hmm. a couple of, uh and then a Canon yeah like XA1 but, the Olymp- little clamshells were like those are like some right? of the best ones I've shot on too they're so convenient right? it's probably the one I use the most just because it's the most convenient yeah yeah I, I love them and yeah, yeah. one of the things for me is like my dad was a photographer and i i grew up with film and film forces me to take better shots mm-hmm. because i'm just i have to think about my composition i have to think about what i'm doing and i don't know i just take better pictures with film and people might think i'm crazy but i i really really if i if i take 36 shots with a digital and then 36 shots with yeah. my film camera. I promise you that one's going to turn out better. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I'm, a, I'm excited to, this next year, I want to, to do some spots in like 16 or 35, just from my, nice. what I've heard and then what like some older guys have told me too. And just like have everybody like flips a switch when they are shooting a production like on film because you know it's not digital yeah. and they just can't play it back again. And it's something that like it's much more delicate. <laughs> We were talking, you, you got to watch the interview I shot last night. It's not up yet. Right. The, the, the yeah. Andrew Rollins when it goes out. Because I asked Andrew that. When I worked with him on, on um, we'd worked together on Angels and Demons, you know, 12 mm-hmm. plus years ago. And it was on film. And I remember watching them shoot on film. And I said, what's it, you know, how has it changed on big productions? And he's like, one of the things that's really weird is they just don't stop rolling now. They just, they just keep those, those cameras, these big old cameras rolling. And they don't cut. And they're just like, let it run. And he's like, you know, but, and one of the things that he pointed out is that it's really tough for the camera team because they kind of lose their focus. They lose mm-hmm. their, you know, their, you know, when you're getting ready for film and suddenly you're rolling, you know, everyone is, you know, focus pullers on his game. Everyone's on their A game, but you know, mm-hmm. the second you just like keep rolling and these people are like, hang on, are we going now? Like, you yeah, know, and yeah. he's like, it's really tough. And it's, it's a whole new kind of ball game. But he said, that he feels like you know at times people have lost something when they don't have that 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 focus to mm-hmm. really kind of you know really take a, pay a special attention to what they're creating. Mm-hmm. Now, you you sh- you shoot some really cool stuff though. Tell me about uh, the center of the sea. I, I looked at that. It was a really interesting project. Yeah, I mean that's when we're in post production for right now. So and it's. Uh under embargo so i'm not sure how much i can talk about but i mean just like the never surf. mind <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's a surf, surf that takes surf place project, yeah. in the middle of the atlantic ocean basically and awesome. it's it's a uh, it was for corona beer and it's coming out um later this month or um coming up next yeah That's awesome yeah, yeah it was really yeah. fun it was my first surf film and so i had a really fun time with the crew out there and what was yeah. it like i mean i was shooting a surf film because i mean I, i've always wanted to shoot a surf film they look you know, I've been a huge fan from Endless Summer, Endless Summer mm-hmm. too. I love the the old ones and the newer ones, and the yeah. new stuff is great too. I mean, it, it. I started surfing probably like last year or so as well, and coming from skateboarding, like there's the sa- similar principles when you're actually riding, yeah. But then you're having this whole other element of Mother Nature involved, where yeah. you have to understand how to read a wave and be in the right place at the right time to be able to actually catch it, and. Yeah. That being said, surf films were damn hard. <laughs> like yeah. we we uh, had probably four sessions, four or five sessions 
um, during the five days that we're there, we're usually, and most of my films were shooting either sun at uh, sunrise or sunset. Um, yeah. and so we probably have like between like five to 10 clips that are like noteworthy enough to, to present. And so then it's actually thinking like, do they make sense? And like, just like the, the, the timeline with it, are we going to be able to use all of them? And so, yeah, the surf is probably from what I've heard from other like action sport filmmakers too, is like one of the hardest you can do like snow. Yeah. It all still kind of stands still. You don't have to rely on good weather necessarily, but you can get there when the powder is already fallen and skateboarding. You just have to know how to kind of ride a skateboard as a DP to be able to catch up with everybody and yeah, right. motocross, same sort of thing too. But surfing, it, it seems to me to be one of the hardest types of like action sport mediums to capture. Yeah. Now, were you yeah. guys shooting when you shoot a surf film? Are you uh, that's that's uh, actually I want to touch on that because I have always really re- respected all my skateboarding friends. My one of my brother's uh friends was a professional skateboarder and they were always going out and making making videos all the time. And it was one of the things that was really interesting is that um the skateboarders were always shooting other skateboarders, you know, and there was always the, the one kid who's got the follow, you know, the mm-hmm. follow camera and what I was always amazed by was the quality of the films that were getting put out by, by people who were not trained. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you know, people that were just going out and doing it. And that to me, I was always really respected that. Now, what's it, what was it like, you know, getting into skate? How, how do you shoot skateboarding films? You know, what, what types of camera were you using? Uh, you know, I mean, is it a GoPro? I mean, now what are people doing now? Yeah, I mean, for downhill skateboarding, it's a bit different. You can honestly relate oh, that's it. that's true. Uh, you can relate a bit closer to how a car commercial is shot or how you shoot backcountry mm-hmm. skiing because you're having to always work with a hill or mountain. But yeah. there is the same um, way of capturing as traditional skateboarding is where you have, like, your DSLR or your cinema camera on, like, a caddy or a gimbal while you're going down. It just yeah. depends on how brave you are. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the the big element is that then you're going at, like, 45 50 miles an hour and like 70 80 like 80k like having to um then hold a camera going down there and so like a lot of times because we're a bunch of idiots we would um strap a camera to the front of a car on like a fish eye with a fish eye lens on it to make it look faster than it actually is so it looks like you're on like 120k or whatever and a car would chase you down the hill and you, it's, since it's a fish eye lens and you have to get really close to actually see detail of skater. We wouldn't be any further than like six feet or like a meter away. Um, Whoa. And, and so you're, you're, you have this car that you can hear the engine rubbing behind you as you're going down, probably an open road in like the French Alps or whatever, trying to like be cool and say stop. You kind of have to just forget about it, like let the cloud in the back of your head just puff up a bit and keep focusing straight. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have some, I have some good friends from, from California, um, that do incredible job at stuff and are most wild guys when it comes to doing that in like Laguna, uh, beach, like neighborhoods and oh, dude. yeah, it's Crazy wild. Hills there. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's wild. And it's like totally stupid the way we're doing it. Like there's no, like there's hardly been any productions that have done it right. There's a few car commercials or just kind of like, like pieces that they kind of do like, Oh, let's race down the hill together and whatnot, which it looks incredible, but most of the time you're having to, to do it like a cowboy and like either hold the camera, pull it from a car or like you're shooting across the, the, the Canyon to be able to get them going down the road too. But, um, there's a few good shot, like angles that people know how to get to make things look fastest or whatever. And so, um, that's, I guess is then kind of the etiquette of how we know how to make it look good just because we know how to make ourselves look faster, stylish. That's pretty actually awesome, man. Yeah. Like it, 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 and it's something that, you know, people that are, I, I feel like if other film, I mean, sure. We don't necessarily always want to be, you know, for other types of film, if people knew how to do some of these tricks or not tricks, but techniques, mm-hmm. you know, it can, it can make everyone a better filmmaker, you know, because it's like each of these different, these different arts have their own thing. I, I'm fascinated by, um, one of the things I'm absolutely fascinated by are these downhill races on mountain bikes. You, you know, I know it's just yeah. mainly GoPro stuff, but like they have the one in Chile, the Valparaiso downhill, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and like the guys are just racing 
down from the top of 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 the city down to the bottom and it's just yeah. it's awesome man but there's also you know some of these people that are doing ridges on mountain bikes and then they just do these crazy downhills and it's just yeah. always fascinating to me like yeah the red speed. bull rampage is probably one of the most yes. heinous heinous events that that gets put on there but like it, it's next up what those guys are doing and then yeah with the with all of them like strapped with like gopros and stuff you get the most just insane perspective on that sort of work yeah yeah what 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 type of um what type of work would you like to be doing what type of like what type of action sport work or just outside of action sports what would you like to be doing you know long term yeah i mean um going to features is kind of like one of the next like milestones of everything i'm um trying to go with like doing these sort of short docs like the the piece that we had um done for center of the sea is kind of like a replay on these two girls stories so it's kind of a reconstructed um mm. non-fiction story but you're still kind of having to do performance takes and stuff like that so it's not true documentarian work which i um i i enjoy being able to construct like reality in my own way like being able to kind of re- like take somebody's story or like a part of their life and like replay it almost when it comes to my documentary work but um, being able to practice scripting and work like that as well and being able to have um, more talking head work, having it be very um, like person focused that's based on a true story, I guess is what I'm trying to get at then is that doing work that is based on a true story, but that you're um, you're representing in your own way, I guess. Um, I mean, there's mm-hmm. plenty of plenty of ways to the first one that comes to mind is like Wolf of Wall Street. Like it's, it's yeah. based on a true story. It's like a portrait film about this certain time of this guy's life, but yeah. it's all based on like crazy facts and like what this guy had done with his life and, and kind of take that and put it into a lot of different ways and just how you want to, to frame it and how you want to appreciate for that. So yeah, that'd be kind of the, the way I want to go with it. Um, for right now I'm just wanting to continue to practice the craft and, um, figure out just all the different technicalities with it, like all the different ways of concepting um, these ideas, like really figuring out like scripting, everything like that as well. But for right now, it's been great to, to run around with these people that are really passionate about um, the subjects we're capturing and the clients we have on board too are ones that like truly believe in the ideas we're going to bring to life. And they're just like, toss the product in there somewhere like we trust you and so it's like that's awesome uh yeah it, it's it's been really convenient that way thankfully yeah there was a one of my favorite videos like that was um casey neistat's uh yeah. it was a it was a commercial he did for samson and essentially yeah. the the entire video they're just getting dragged around this resort on like this massive drone that they built you know this absolutely mm-hmm. huge drone and it's like pulling them around on the on, on you know on their snowboard and and then at the very end there's like this tagline samsung you know it's mm-hmm. like oh man you didn't even know it was an advertisement i was like damn yeah that was awesome yeah i think that's something that's very new age of like very woke brands to yeah. say um, where they understand that millennials and Gen Z don't fall for like a product being shown and being stuffed down their throat. They need it to be like affiliated with a person or with an action that they believe in. Um, yeah. cause they, they see like, we see through that stuff so quickly. And so you have to be a bit clever in how you want to, to deliver like your new campaign, your new product as well. Cause like mm-hmm. the traditional stuff that even just say like five years ago, like it's, it's not working at like much anymore now, like doing stuff with like influencers or doing work that has to do with like, um, uh, a greater like action or, um, activism, I think is something that, um, a lot of brands are jumping onto and the ones I've been able to work with, like understand that and like definitely want to go in that way. But a lot of times are still, um, ran by some other folks that, have to have uh some new age marketing teams to say like hey this is a good idea like yeah let's trust this it's the way that the world's going and yeah like especially with like casey like it's it's one of those things that he he definitely like understands that and the people like in that whole realm to see the um the benefit of that as well right it's yeah. awesome now what what are some of the films that inspired you what are some of your go-to films that you you know like that you kind of model yourself after, um, or just uh, like? Uncut Gems is probably one of my favorites. Oh, it's, that's a good film, man. I, I, I think just one thing about most recently, Uncut Gems. God, 
Yeah, the Safety brothers are so damn good at what they do. Yeah. I think like the way like it's just an anxiety trip the entire movie, yeah. and it's just the yeah. beautiful abstract shots that they're able to bring in. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's outstanding. I think recently the um, TV show White Lotus, like we've had so many just like crit. Oh, it's fantastic. It's like we we've had so many like wild shows. Like I also love Succession. Like like yeah. where it's just it's just people in a room talking. But it is just like it, it twists your stomach again. And Succession has some insanely funny just like dialogue to it that doesn't have to have, like have that point to it. It's just super clever writing. And then there's also like Westworld. Like uh, love Westworld. Uh, uh, doing doing a Western is definitely up there for what I want to do. Um, Dude, Reven- I'm Revenant. Hundred yeah. percent with you. Hundred percent with you. Yeah, doing um sort of a uh, Revenant I'm, was I'm, awesome too. Revenant as well. I, I'm reading a a book my brother-in-law gave me about um like a, a railroad builder in idaho which is where i'm from um nice. i was raised in idaho and so it was, it was like 1920s idaho um oh, wow. it's just a really it's just a really brutal book about how like there was just nothing out in the west um yeah. and i think like, having the the courage to ask an author if we could build, make a movie based on their book i would love to do um soon as well and and something that has to do with kind of like gritty old america sounds great like kind of even the mountaineers of like Colorado yeah. or something too sounds really, really sick to do, but that has to then take, um, a bit more of the modern style to it. Like how Revenant had done, how Westworld does as well. Like sci-fi is yeah. the, like the more like gritty sci-fi dystopian stuff, and, like total recall. I think it's dope mm-hmm. as well. And so there's a lot of stuff that gets me, gets me excited like that. And, um, it's just, That's it's awesome. just in fine a time to be able to, to put those pieces together and get the right team together. But definitely, um, to play on like setting up those sort of stuff soon as well. Well, I think, you know, what, what I really like about a lot of those too, is reinventing the way we look at these, 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 like a Western man that's been done so many mm-hmm. different ways, you know, it, but yet, you know, there's a new take on it. You can always spin it some way and like, and just repackage it. Even, um, what was it? Zack Snyder's army of the dead. The, the one that just came out, um, mm-hmm. in the way he shot that with like all of the, uh, all of the tilt focus lenses, you know, so yeah, everything yeah. was like really, de- you know, people like, you know, that was a really funny because I was like, I hadn't read about that before I, they, they shot it. But then I was like watching, I was like, man, this is like, this is some really crazy, you know, this looks like it's a tilt focus lens or something. And, and all of a sudden yeah. I realized, and like people were like going on, there was like, I was looking at all these message boards and people were like, is something wrong with my TV? You know, why does it look like this? And what I was like, you know, I respect him for simply, Hey, let's, let's try something different. Let's shoot it yeah. in a different way. And it was really cool to me, yeah, but you know, I, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, then there was like tenant where they just, I mean, obviously it's insanely constructed and accurate and how they had to, to make it happen, but they reversed their footage and they, right. well, they want, they won via the uh, Oscar for VFX or something. <laughs> and yeah. then there was, there was a whole bunch of jokes about that too, how they just reversed their footage, but just like, the, the small different like mechanisms that they use just to like either have people talking backwards or just um, the way that they're able to set their special effects to play correctly when they played it in reverse. And I don't know, just a lot, I guess, of that emotion of um, there was just one scene in particular where I remember it, it was one of the first opening shots when they're um, raiding the auditorium and there's just this like, yeah. 10 seconds scene of this guy just running so, so hard down, down the straight line. And I just thought in my head, like, God, I just know Christopher Nolan just told this guy to like haul ass down the road, like down the hallway <laughs> right now. And they just get like that. And like Black Panther has that sort of those action sequences too, where you just, you can tell there's so much emotion behind it. And I think really getting yeah. in and being able to focus more on um, like an actual person's like a, emotional delivery when it comes to showing some on frame is something that I really want to practice more and more since like coming from action sport and outdoor stuff, you don't get to practice that so much. It's a lot more about the subject matter than it is about um, the person sometimes, especially when you're having to work yeah. on a tight budget or you're having to um, do this and that you don't always get the chance to have like the, rea- or the, the right reaction to something since you have some other things you're needing to, to try to capture. But like in some of my most recent like um pieces i've done i like i got super lucky by getting like a perfect reaction i couldn't have like 
like articulated. Like there's a, a shot from a, a Leica film I did where we have a bunch of dirt bikers running past our, our uh, star Nikki. And she just gives like the best laugh afterwards. Cause it was the first take we did. And the, and the dirt bikers awesome. came really close to her as she was shooting by them. And she kind of got pushed over and then was like laughing right back at camera. And that's one of the takes that we ended up using awesome. for the, for a final piece. And like, God, like I just want to be able to like have that same like emotion, every single like shot that we're pushing through this. Um, and so being able to have just more time for that, like when you get bigger budgets, you get like more like people on board, you get more like safety assurance, you get like the luxury of time as well. It's the most expensive thing that comes to the filmmaking yeah. sometimes is just the time that you get to take like for pre-production for the actual shooting and for, for posts yeah. as well. Yeah. That's really cool, man. I, it, it's nice yeah. to hear about you, uh, how your approach to that. And, you know, and I, I think that there's, in, in the technology is kind of allowed some really cool things. Like this is one of the things that Andrew was talking about last night. It's like, he was a, he was a steady cam guy and for a long time. You know, he was the steady cam guy in the matrix and a lot of these other movies. And he was like, now, you know, these, these, some of these new gimbals are just, you know, and, and I'm, I'm the movie we, we discussed last night was 1917. Like, mm -hmm. like that, that first shot, man of 1917 i just was like watching that again i literally sat down and i watched that same sh shot about 20 times just because i was like i wanted to see if at any point in time someone slipped up because i've i've, I've come from acting and i and, and when you have a big set like that and this is you know this is something that andrew said that was really interesting he's like one of the things that with a with something like that is that when you're shooting and the product is going to be delivered on an iPhone, it's okay. You can have something off in the corner that's, you know, a little bit off. Or, you know, when you're reviewing it on, a, on you know, your monitor that's this big. But he says, when that gets up onto like a 60-foot screen, like the tiniest little thing suddenly is like, what is that? Mm -hmm. You know? You know, th there's these things that are really noticed. And so, you know, he's pointed out that, you know, the absolute attention to detail of of some of these dops and of some of these directors is amazing it's just absolutely amazing you know and so that's to me i'm just i'm just awestruck by those guys you know yeah, mm -hmm. I, I aspire to that but god knows i don't know if i have that attention to detail man but oh i can hope i can hope yeah, yeah. now what 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 what's like a dream project of yours if if you had aladdin's lamp you know, and you could make whatever you want. What type of story would you like to do? Um, I mean, doing something that has to, I think, just, I, I really, really enjoy, um, like, shows and, and films that have to do with um, kids and adult situations where it gets, like, Stranger Things or gets, like, Hunger Games almost mm. as well. I, ju I just saw um, the other day the the pitch trailer for the hunger games which if you yeah. haven't seen it, it it's it's so cool on how like they're able to still like get the idea of the hunger games across by taking out just random clips from a bunch of different movies and playing together like that I, I think being able to do really? um something that's like passengers where we have um just just having kids in a situation that they're having to take on themselves i think like lost in space is another really great example about that these, yeah. these are just like, these are like non ideas. Like it's just random, mm. like floating things that have come to mind. Um, I have friends from around the world as well that have insane backstories from just their families as well that, um, I to re to retell and reconstruct in that way. Also, I think being able to, to just work with like, um, just top tier act, like actors as well, like, like Ben Stiller or something like that as well. And, be able right. to, to have up there. I think, I think there's a lot of things that I, I'm not aware yet that I want to then turn into a movie that I have to either see how lucky I am to have that experience that before almost, or, um, haven't just seen that it could be an idea that you could turn into a movie just because some of the simplest, um, films can, can turn into one. I'm, I'm such an amateur for forgetting which director this was, but really famous mm -hmm. director. One of his first films had been just about, um, 
what it's like being a stalker in New York or a guy who follows people around New York and that's the in, entire film. I think it might have been in Christopher Nolan's first first film. Um, and it's just, it's such a simple idea, but you can think about how far that can take you too. And I think, I think one of my, one of my favorite, like, t- like times where I really started to appreciate like cinema was, um, rear window, back window, rear window. Right. Uh, window. yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like such a simple thing. Like this, like F1 photographer had a bad accident. Now he's having to like, live vicariously through other people's like, uh, lives. Yeah. It was like rear window. And so. I, th- I think when it's just that dumb, that like simple, and you're able to to just create like such a little world around this as well. I think Wes Anderson does a great job at that as well. Like he t- he right. makes so many like mundane things so beautiful. Also, I think right. I-, I think it makes it really relatable for a-, a larger audience too. If it's not such like a far fetched idea, or if it's like not something so so out there, but something that people can like get behind that has like either a lighthearted twist to it, like has to with either like a childhood or um, yeah. it's something that people have experienced before like, or get the idea of. Um, I think it's a really great, great starting point to, to then build into things that are like fully fictional when it comes to doing like Westerns or sci-fi. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan. And my, yeah, my yeah, hands yeah, down favorite movie is, uh, I love The Life Aquatic. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I absolutely love like I, I love his other stuff, but I don't know why. Oh, I, I'm a Bill Murray fan, and 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 one of the things yeah. is just Wes Anderson's really really smart. With you know, he takes all these colors, all these you know you know really huge casts, but he works on simple themes. You know, like like the Life Aquatic is really a story about this like a kid trying to find his dad. And mm-hmm. a man trying to reconcile himself with with his own past, you know, and his own his own faults, and and it, it, it's a redemption story, you know, whatever whatever it might be beyond that. There's a lot of different working parts, but it's essentially a redemption story, and that's one of the things that um, that I absolutely I, I'm doing my master's right now in screenwriting, and you know. The, the our professor was just beating it into us like what is the theme what are you trying to talk about what is mm-hmm. this movie you know you don't not everything has to have a message you don't necessarily have to try to build something in there but you do have to have a topic that you are kind of exploring and maybe even deep diving in you know so it's fun now what type of um what type of topics are in you said the the idea of children and adult situations now can you tell me more about that like um those are really interesting and and, and, you know i remember when i was growing up reading like the lord of the flies which is a Mm -hmm. similar concept to Mm -hmm. what was it the um what was that japanese one there was a japanese one that was essentially like a lord of the flies uh it just turned like 40 or something no battle royale have you ever heard of that oh yeah 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 yeah, there was a yeah. similar concept to like these kids put into these, you know, Hunger Games like situation. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Squid Games is kind of like a fun like reverse Super on that cool. too. I'm on the yeah. last episode right now. It, it's it's like a terribly depressing thing, and they just like turn your heart every like single episode for that. But uh, I, I think there, there's a vulnerability. I think with like like emotional vulnerability when it gets to kids that they don't entirely understand like sometimes social etiquette so you can like if you've yeah. seen fear if you've seen fear street um i believe they're all based on books and everybody kind of talks like they're almost like from a book almost like they don't they're not like oh, wow. they're not like functioning like psychologically like straight humans when it gets that sort of thing like they're all kind of twists in some way but they like look like a kid they sort of talk like a kid and they behave like one so it, it puts you like somewhere in just this like uncanny like emotional valley I think is is super cool for that uh, to be able to still construct like a kid's like behaviors in a bit of a different way. I think having yeah. something like in the Hunger Games or in um, Stranger Things where you're putting them into a situation that doesn't happen to a kid, I think. Yeah. Like, right. I, when <laughs> I, when I, when I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when when I was a kid, I like I was such a Star Wars fan. I was so convinced I had the Force. And I'm like, like just trying to remember that like little bit of just imagination that came from that, I think is something that you can kind of reconstruct for people if you are able to yeah. convince them that like, hey, like 
this this world is real right now like as far as you're concerned you're gonna sit in this like movie theater for two hours you paid to get in here you're only gonna leave with a memory like this they, you just enjoy it like here, here's a bunch yeah. of stuff here's a bunch of like sounds that and you're gonna think that it's all real i mean harry potter like did that incredibly incredibly i'm i was thinking the, about harry potter yeah, yeah like, i'm not the biggest <laughs> harry potter fan like unfortunately i i haven't yeah it, there's a a lot of other ones I, I can really get behind. Um, maybe I'm just like trying to be hipster with just against the hype of it, but I think they're still <laughs> incredible, incredible movies. Um, but yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think it, I think it's something that maybe just at my age as well, just being able to really appreciate that too. And I hope I can hold on to that as well. But um, I, I think it's just the fun of being able to tell people who's probably like a younger to a middle age audience Hey, do you remember like thinking about this when you were a kid or like wanting to be like this sort of thing too? Yeah. I think like, like ET had done a, a great job of that too, of what right. everybody hopes like yeah. happens to them as a kid, like an alien comes in your room. Like, then at the same time too, when I then watched my, my dad had me watch alien when I was like eight years old and I was terrified of face huggers <laughs> and I like that petrified me for so long. <laughs> and that like the alien and predator movies are just some of my favorite, like, like, when i don't know when you're looking at like the first light of the day and it's just completely blue hour you're just like god i just want to make an entire movie that like has to do with like this like palette right now and that's like horror movies <laughs> for a good part it's just like dark right. moody films which is great to go but yeah that was just a big ramble about nothing but that was basically the no, dude, no, this is way awesome of saying that. <laughs> yeah 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 well and there's a really interesting point like there was um sometimes my, my daughter's five and there's this one um and we do talk about the innocence of a kid. And it was really interesting that you talked about that topic because I, I watched this 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 show that she watches. It's called Morphle. And essentially, it's a kid's cartoon, right? Mm -hmm. Not interesting or anything. But the, the premise, I, I in my my messed up mind, I keep, you know, spinning over this story because the premise is this, this character that's kind of like an alien or something that can morph into anything can turn into a rocket ship. It can turn into this uh -huh. and turn into that. And I was like, and I was like, man, if this, this character was for real, like every single government on this planet yeah. would be trying to hunt this thing down and weaponize yeah. it. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And it's like, so I'm watching this kid show. And so like, there is this, like this innocence where you have to like kind of bridge that gap. And so that's a, that's a really interesting thing. And I, and I, I agree. Like, so Harry Potter, like, they didn't really kind of help the kids kind of, you know, like mm -hmm. you can look online, like Dumbledore was kind of a horrible teacher. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah, up yeah. There. You can do it, Harry. What the hell yeah. am I doing? Man? Just <laughs> they kind of just like let them on their own like that. I mean, I've been, I think like the Padawans or something that came from Star Wars then too, like, yeah, kind of just, they kind of set them up for failure as well when they did right. them. But I, I <laughs> uh, I, the whole the the prequel trilogy of all of them i think uh it, it's a great like story that whoever was like a fanatic of star wars just like want to be like anakin like so badly like that or right. like yeah like doing like, cool. sp like speed razors and stuff like that too it just sounds like the wildest thing to be able to do and like, you, right? you could totally get you totally get convinced about it when you're a kid like this this world is real like yeah yeah. Well, and that's that's the beauty of film is that it can transport you into this other world. Yeah, and 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 the 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 prequel trilogy trilogy. I know people hate on them, but if you start reading up on George Lucas's and is it I don't know what it's called if it's ring theory or circle theory about how he he writes in this certain way, and really? there is yeah 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 you gotta look yeah. it up. So, yeah, yeah. And so he he has this this way that he loops everything and he had that planned for the new trilogy as well but uh then you know they kind of just didn't go down yeah, that yeah. i still don't know it, i i've got a beef i'm not one of the fans of the the new trilogy and not because i didn't think that the films were great but i didn't know how how can you have one of the most iconic franchises ever and literally not have a three-story arc like you give yeah. these different directors and like just like kind of do your own thing you know <laughs> yeah i think i, I think with the solo mandalorian were like incredible oh like the, my yeah God. there's there's oh, so dope and what they're doing with God. the technology there too is insane like 
but with yeah with the new trilogy they're really beautiful but they're not like as captivating as like the other ones where like you don't fall in love yeah. with the characters or anything like so much but anymore, the mandalorian but mandalorian Oof. it's incredible yeah i think it's, it's amazing fantastic on how they're able to do that much with a tv show the car the, the 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 documentary that i saw too it was like a making of documentary mm-hmm. about the guy who did the music for that oh, amazing and he just he just like kind of locked himself into a room, pulled out a bunch of yeah. these big old flutes, you know, or, or and they're not flutes, yeah. they were like recorders, you know, like the recorders that kids play, yeah. except the soundtrack's you know, iconic really, in it. Whew. Yeah, and the tech. That was not something too that, yeah. that my friend was talking about yesterday. Is like these screens are just they're giving people so much so many more options. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, it's awesome. So I, I, my, my dream is to have some type of a ability to work on something related to like the Star Wars series, franchise, but especially the Mandalorian series. Like, oh my mm-hmm. god, dude! Absolutely, dream, dream come true, right there, man. Yeah, they, I mean, they flipped. I, go ahead, go ahead, please. They they flipped through a whole bunch of directors throughout their seasons too. So then, <laughs> more more likelihood then. Yeah, right? No, exactly. There's, there's a chance. There's a chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Um, and one of the things, too, is like... One of the things that I'm really excited about that we're seeing with TV, especially because of streaming. You know, streaming, they need content. And mm-hmm. the absolute scale of the world building. You know, you didn't get to see that. You know, a lot of films in the past were one-off. You might get some fun trilogies, but they didn't have that scale of world building, you know, that was built into them. But now, you know, you've got all of these different shows that die deep dive into these, you know, really interesting worlds. And like you have been saying, like, you feel transported to this location, you know? I, I, dude, I'm a huge Jedi fan. I'm a huge mm-hmm. Star Wars fan, too. I have a multiple you know yodas around my room and you know we, we do some lightsaber fights in my house with my daughter and, wonderful you know, yeah, yeah the forces the forces with uh-huh. her <laughs> but you know it, when you watch the mandalorian or these other shows i mean you're there you really yeah, are yeah. there and so uh, we, w- w- what do you think about some of these world buildings like are do you have are you a fan of any of these 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 greater you know like whether it be the witcher or you know, the mandalorian obviously but you know all these other series that you might find interesting yeah i mean i think i think a lot of them like i mean like westworld for example like it's if, good yeah like uh, people love like the fun and games that come with just like having to see all the different characters and stuff. And I think like when you walk into the like cantina and star Wars, and you see all the different like people and everything. Like you just want a whole movie that's just like showing different, like just yeah. different types of people that live here. You just want like one big filler episode that just has to do with all that stuff. And I, I think yeah. they know that the right dose to add into all that, like with total recall, like showing you on how much of the like outer world there actually is or um, edge of tomorrow um then yes. there's like another one that oh. they, they, they that's a really badass one. i love that movie man yeah love yeah, yeah. that movie um and yeah like i i think it is something that then if you have like an incredible like compositing team that can really like make beautiful beautiful like uh like landscapes like that or cityscapes or then really being able to have great like animators if you're having to have like foreign creatures and stuff like that too like that's something being able to work with vfx in that way i think if you're able to kind of like nonchalantly like show all these crazy things, but you're packaging in a way like total recall, like having like all these different places and things, but nothing's too far out there. Cause you're like under the, like understanding that you're watching a movie about the future. So these things could be there and it's not just like taking away from the movie sometimes. Um, I think is an incredible way to just then, um, be able to play through imagination where in any other like type of job you couldn't be able to do that. And I think that's something that I'm, I'm then sort of missing too with just doing like documentarian sort of stuff is just being able to like play with imagination that way more and more. I think be able to already have um, like replay people like part of people's lives in that way is a nice way to, to practice it like a certain component of all that but then that has to do with more of the concepting side of it but then when you're able to play more with like the visuals and the actual execution of it um, which in, in theory is a bit more of the thing that you need, just need to get the right team together to be able to accomplish. And the concepting is more under the director's job for that. Um, it's something I'm really, really excited to be able to, to make happen like that. 
Well, man, I, I look forward to seeing what yeah. type of stuff you start creating, brother. That's pretty, pretty exciting. Now, yeah, exciting. if you had any advice for other people, like from that you, you've learned in your career, what type of advice would you give to people that are coming up like you are, or, you know, in the same, you know, a coming down this path? I don't know you're young, but I'm sure you got some wisdom. <laughs> I mean, like the, the past like year and a half or two years of just kind of always being on the go and um, not you, you sacrifice like financial stability to be able to do the, the sort of work we do and just making the absolute most of every opportunity you have. Like if you never know like what, like where an opportunity is going to take you. Um, and, and being able to, to do the absolute most with that, I heard a, a quote the other day as well that goes into just continuously practicing the craft and how you do have to like do your own like passion projects. And that could be the one thing that really gets yeah. you the ticket to in the right person's, um, and in, in the right door. And so I think saying like practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect and that yeah. you can I'm, I'm saying this verbatim verbatim from a film riot podcast i just listened to the other day about but <laughs> it, it, totally, it totally applies and how you can lazily kick a soccer ball against your garage door but and never get better but if you try kicking mm -hmm. that same soccer ball perfectly in the corner every single time you're going to be fantastic and so just every chance you get mm -hmm. to either try something new doing something that is better than what's already out there. Uh, absolutely. Like taking inspiration from, from these sort of things. What happens if you put two of these really cool things together? Does it make something better? Does it make something worse? Uh, I mm. always just kind of building the confidence to play. Like it's, it's a really playful like industry we're in. Like we're making pictures and sounds that then provoke an emotion. Right. And yeah, I think, I think, always just being able to have the courage to take that sort of risk to be able to to understand that you're going to have to sacrifice a bit to get to the place you want to go to and definitely do that passion project you need to because we're always one banger away from from making it so i think yeah, i think that's what I'd, what i'd have to say that's awesome i yeah. i'm i'm a martial artist and i i there was one one of the points that you made there about like practice and perfect practice like I think that when I was coming up, you know, we would drill doing things the right way and you do it again and you do it again and you do it again. And there's a monotony to doing it, but you know, that's, it, 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 it's like, you can try new ways to do it. You can get out and, and, and play with it, you know, but at the same time, you have to always be trying to refine your craft because you know, you know, for like the martial arts, you know, like there was this one, funny comic way back in the day and like it was all these guys training and like all of a sudden these aliens got off this sh this ship and the aliens were made of bricks and pieces of wood and it was like finally our moment has arrived you know it was like so <laughs> stupid because they've been training to break pieces of wood and bricks you know what i mean so it's like um but my point b like we're always, my friend and I, we, we have a, a term, you know, like that we love to, to talk about if she's an acting manager and she, she and I, and I, I told her this term and she loved it. And she uses it all the time for her actors now and sharpening the sword. Like sometimes you don't know when an opportunity is going to come, but you still have to be prepping. Like, you know, that warrior, they, you know, they were keeping the shorts sword sharp. You don't mm -hmm. want to let things get dull. You want to be active and, and kind of doing your own thing, which is again, why I'm, I, I love the creator generation. I love this new, you know, when, 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 when I was coming up, if you wanted to make a film, I, I, I'm the beginning of the DSLR. I remember the first mm -hmm. DSLR that I had. I remember when that stuff came out and it changed the game. You know, the Canon, you know, 5D Mark II, man, was, you know, had video on it. Mm -hmm. You know, 5D1, mm -hmm. no, it was still a photography camera. But the 5D2, you could start running, you know, video on the video quality was not bad, you know. But then, then after that, it was just like a cascade of people having the ability to make their own stuff, you know, and it was an absolute game changer and then you get you know all of the softwares just became so much easier to use my point being there's no excuse for people not to be making stuff now you know what i mean mm -hmm. like 
you don't it's like you try to do it 20 years ago you got to go buy all the film and you better have to not mm-hmm. splice it mm-hmm. and you got all of it it was prohibitive you know it was expensive you know if you want to start getting into making a feature or something that can be projected on the screen but now man you know go you can rent you know the sony a7s3 or whatever you know black magic pockets and 6k you know and boom you've got something that is worthy of being submitted to festivals you know so yeah, i love yeah. it man uh, the the five D I mean well my it reminds me of one of my other really favorite films is Francis Ha, it's one of the most yeah. beautiful it, it's like probably I don't know if you consider it cinephile maybe I'm just saying that because it's black and white but it's like a beautiful mm. piece like in New York I love it when there's like anything any movies to do about New York just because there's so much like imagination that surrounds it too but it was it was all shot in the five D I think um, Driver is that in that one as well when he was really early on and like some very iconic actors are in that one and they shot on a 5d and ran around new york and paris with this and i, I think it the more you have to use minimal tech the more you need to put emphasis on your actual like subject matter you're shooting for yes you can definitely yes. like, uh, you, you can you can definitely make up for having like uh poor video quality like make the audio a bit nicer but just really like you can really hone in on on like what your actual like scripting is or what like people in your film are actually doing. And, um, I, I think being able to practice that constantly. And if it's just like you and your friends, just like trying different ways of like cutting stuff or like, if it's just like doing doodles on a piece of paper that look both ways and just doing voiceover to it too. I think like I'm, a, I'm a, a, a big sucker for quotes still. And it, I remember one that I, I think it was from a Samsung commercial as well too, that, um, that's awesome. It goes, uh, it's what you do in the dark that puts you in the light. And it, it's, it's yeah. always a stuff like while you don't yeah. have a lot of people looking at you, like that's when you should be messing up and trying and trying and trying yeah. again, like try really hard, but appreciate it now. Cause then like when you get to the point and I, I I'm so thankful that I'm not in that, uh, the huge audience, that sort of thing. Now I can still keep practicing that. Um, but for when you have to put in front of the audience, like you see how much like people get like torn apart when they do like a bad film or a bad album or something too. And it, yeah, being appreciative of the position you're in now and just to try new things to fail, to then do it again and then succeed is like a huge luxury that you'll be looking back on and be thankful for and wishing that you could have some of that time again too. That is, that's, that's some solid advice, man. You just dropped a <laughs> wisdom bomb right there. <laughs> I know. I appreciate it, man. Well, I want to say thank you for coming on to the podcast today, man. I really, it was, it was a fun conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a joy. Uh...